for the foundations of the world that we would fulfill to be a blessing to him, to be a blessing to others, and to be a blessing to ourselves. Because when you live in your dream, you know that you're blessed for it. How many of you guys are doing something you really dreamed of doing all your life? Oh, man, that's, man, we only got like three, I see three hands, four. Could I get a fifth hand, a fifth hand, sixth hand? Okay, look, the truth is this. Your profession is not necessarily the dream of God for you. Doesn't mean that it can't be. But most often what I've found is it's the thing that gives you life, that gives you hope, this sense of purpose and belonging, that, that your life is actually bigger than you. Does this make sense at all, church? That's what this series is about. So listen, God works in dreams. He works through hope. Hope and dreams are kind of like reciprocal. They're kind of weird. Because if you have a dream, then you hope that it'll happen. If you have hope, then you dream that it'll happen. They kind of go together. You know, the Bible actually says this. It says this. It says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. You guys ever really wanted something to happen? Come on, help me out. You guys are pathetic this morning. You're like, I'm still in the Holy Spirit land, Pastor. I don't want to talk. You got to talk to me. I got to know you're in the room. You ever really wanted something to happen yes. and had to wait? Uh, yes. isn't, it, uh, isn't it horrible? Yes. It, it's terrible. Like, you're, like inside, you're like, please, God, could you release this thing? I feel that way as a pastor, by the way. I love what God does through our church, but there's a longing, a hunger in me to see the next season released. And I, it's just like in every week that goes by, that I don't see inklings of it. Like really, I, I just kind of like, God, when is it going to happen? But God said, hope deferred will make the heart sick. But watch, a longing fulfilled is the tree of life. You ever had any of your dreams met? And doesn't it just feel like, don't you just want to do that like Toyota dance where you jump, you know, that thing? <laughs> yeah, don't you want to do that? Yeah. Because there's something about realizing God weaving into your experience that is amazingly powerful. See, God wired us to dream. He created dreams as part of the human existence because he wants us to believe in him. He wants us to hope, to wait with confident expectation that God will do something great. So I want to give you a couple principles. I'm going to be all over in my notes because we are, don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to do my best to not keep you here till one o'clock. No, I'm playing. I, I, I don't, I, that, that's really late. Expectations, expectancy, okay? Expectations. It, like hope means that you're expecting God to do something, work, act, to do something on your behalf. You guys with me? If you're hoping you want God to... Okay, the, um, the answer is act. If you're hoping you want God to... That, there we go. Wow, that was, you guys are smart. That was really awesome. You want God to move. That's what hope is about. And God, as we see, when we live in expectation, this is what's going on. We're attaching ourselves to a God who's a God of promise. We're dreaming. You ever walk into something? Like I walk into, this is true. Every Sunday morning, I walk in expecting people to encounter God. I do. And when it does, you can ask my staff. When it doesn't flow, we sit in staff meeting and go, what did we do wrong? What did we miss? What did I miss? What could we have done differently? What would have helped people experience God's love this morning? We do that every single week. We debrief what we did. How do we do excellence to honor God? Every week I come in with the hopeful expectation that God is going to meet with people. Now expectancy is similar, but not the same. Expectation has an outcome. Expectancy says this, I trust the nature of God, that he's good, that he's merciful, that he's gracious, that he's full of loving kindness and truth, and that he's for me and he's not what? Against me. See, that's what expectancy does. It keeps you in this place of believing and dreaming that God will do great things. See, when, when it's deferred, dragged out, our heart gets sick. It literally means this, to be sick inwardly in your soul. You guys ever had to wait too long? Watch, watch. And your mind starts playing tricks on you? Man, God ain't never going to come out. I've been praying and praying and I'm still waiting and waiting. He, and then you start to say this stuff to yourself. He must not care about me. Oh, come on. Am I talking to anybody? Doesn't, don't we do this? And then we start like, Ooh, you get all poopy attitude. And you start acting stupid. Don't we do this? Oh, come on. Yeah, okay, I do this. I'll just tell on myself. We do this when hope is deferred, when our heart gets sick. It literally means to be sick inwardly, to not have a sense that God is full of loving kindness, that he's for you. And he's not against you. And, and this series is about trying to talk to you about releasing into the next season, not losing sight of what God has spoken into you. For some of you, you already have an idea of the dream. For others, you've never given yourself permission to dream. 
because you don't want to be disappointed. Am I talking to anybody right now? I don't want to dream. I had a dream when I was young, but I don't want to dream now because if I dream now, if nothing happens, then I can't get disappointed if I don't have any expectation of God at all. But I want to tell you that God is a dream giver. He wants us to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we could ask or think in him. He wants greatness for our lives. So frustration, anybody get frustrated in the room? Yeah. I'm, I'm, look, I'm glad you guys said that. I'm not alone. Not alone, because I get frustrated pretty easily, especially when it comes to things about dreams. So, you know, I have this idea that our church is supposed to expand. And I don't mean just numerically here, I, that we're supposed to do more, d develop leaders, raise up other leaders. And, and Heather and I were talking about this this week. And, I, and so I asked her this question. By the way, you should ask this question of your spouse if you have a dream. This is important. I said, do you think this is a good dream? And she said, I don't know. So, so I hit her. No, I'm, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> she goes, I don't, I don't know. And I said, yeah, but I think it would be a good thing to replicate. You know, I start to sell pitch to her. You know what I'm saying? She goes, she goes well, I don't know. I mean, did, did God tell you or is it just something you want? And I went, oh, man, that, like, that's a rough question. You guys get what I'm saying? That's a rough question. And I said, well, I think it's something God wants. And she goes, but, but every pastor kind of wants to replicate themselves. Doesn't every kind of like they want more of themselves out there? So, so I hit her again. No, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> but she was asking really honest questions, real questions. Like, if you want to dream for what God will do through your life, are you sure that it's not being driven by your own stuff? Your, your own need for notoriety, identity? And, and so it's kind of funny because last week after the service, um, one of you lovely folks left a note on my desk saying, well, maybe you're not supposed to plant more churches in the States because the States have plenty of churches. Maybe you're supposed to do it somewhere else. Hint, hint, like Guatemala. <laughs> That's what they said. And I thought, I don't, I, I don't know. It, but it sent me to prayer. It sent me to say this. I don't want to live in a sense of a, an unrealized dream, like God spoke to do something bigger, greater, more, and not say, well, it doesn't fit my mold, God, so this can't really be your dream, or that can't be where it's supposed to happen. Am I telling anybody anything right now? Like sometimes we have to be willing to embrace the dream and then let God shape it. Let him order it. Let him create the pathway. Because what's impossible for man is what with God? Possible. possible. That's how it works. And when it's impossible with us, all things are possible for God. So I want to encourage you, don't lose sight of what you dream. So watch, watch I, I, I got to talk to a few of you guys right now because I know this is going on. Because some of you in the room, you're given to prayer and you want to see more people healed. Okay, L listen. Okay. Let it happen. Pray for them. Some of you are in the room. You want to see more people get saved. That's because you have an evangelistic heart. You want to, like, everybody should go to Jesus in heaven with me. This is great. Go do it. Because God will meet you where you dream to step out. But if you don't ever step out, you will always live in a dream without a reality. You'll always live in a notion without an outcome. See, it's why I'm always saying this. Get outside of the building. Come to ministry and get to the Holy Spirit class. You'll discover how God has gifted you, and you might find that what you're doing is not what you should be doing. And what you should be doing will be way more fun and a greater blessing. You know, I remember when Heather and I got married, and there was this time where she said, hey, let's go do missions for a little while. And I remember I was like, uh-uh. I got to plant me a church. Got to plant me a church. Don't need no bugs and dirt. Don't want to do that mission stuff. You know what's funny is like, now, if I could do that over again, I would probably say yes to it. Anybody ever looked backwards and thought I should have listened to her? Guys, I'm talking to you. <laughs> I'm just playing a little bit, but not really. I'm saying that some of our dreams get realized when we take steps and risks, when we let God, listen, let God shape the plan. He put the initial dream in you. Let him shape it into what he intends it to be. And listen, be patient. Look at somebody say, be patient. Be patient. Be patient. God's not done yet. Be patient. You never know what he's up to. L listen, I want to give some of you freedom to dream, permission to remember that God has not forgotten what he spoke into you or about you. Listen, some of you have received it by prophetic word. You got a verse while you're reading your Bible. You were out and about and somebody encouraged you. Don't lose sight of what God speaks. I want to give you permission. Dream. Dream big. Don't lose sight of it. 
God hasn't changed his mind. He doesn't want us to be living in pain, living with unrealized dreams. He wants us to go forward with him. So the dreamer, man, how many of you guys know the story of Joseph? This is Genesis chapter 37. You guys can flip your Bibles open. Genesis chapter 37. We're going to look at Joseph. Now, Joseph is an interesting story because Joseph is the, the youngest of, or the second youngest, pardon me, of 12 sons. But at this point, he's the youngest of 11 sons. His littlest brother is not born yet. So I can relate to this. I'm the baby of 12 kids, okay? So when I read this story, I can totally connect to what his older brothers and sisters were thinking about him when he tells them what God is telling them. So it's Genesis chapter 37. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. And, and then um, I'll break down some of the, the principles that are in it. So let's pick this up. Uh, actually, let's start in verse one. It says, now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned. Um, in the land of Canaan. Now, Jacob's Joseph's dad. These are the records of the generations. Joseph, when, when he was 17, man, my eyes aren't good, years of age, was pastoring the flock, and his, brothers were, his brother was still young, along with the sons of a whole bunch of hard names. Verse 3. Um, now, Israel, <laughs> now, Israel loved Joseph more than all of his sons. Can you say problem? Yeah. That's a problem. You should not love one kid more than the other. Like my kids always tease me, Dad, I'm your favorite. I'm like, I'm quite fond of all of you. You know, so yeah, anyways. So listen, now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his other sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very, a very colored tunic or a coat, Joseph in the multicolored tunic. His brothers saw that, that, that his father loved him more than all of the other brothers and they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. So they caused so much division. Now watch, you've got a little brother who everybody else in the household except for dad hates. That's the picture, you guys with me? That's the picture, okay, watch. Then Joseph had a dream. You gotta love this, I love this, I think this is hilarious. And when he told his brothers, they hated him even more. Watch his dream. He said to them, please listen to this dream which I've had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect, and behold, your sheaves gathered around, and they bowed down to my sheaf. I'm like, okay, we already don't like you. <laughs> That's what's going on. Then his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Like, uh, let's listen, not only is this kind of odd period, but in Jewish culture, the youngest kid does not get the best stuff. That's not how things roll. Should be the eldest that's getting it. Are you really going to reign over us? Are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. Now he had still another dream, like one dream wasn't enough, right? You think this kid had learned. Like if he had a dream and they already rejected the first dream, would you go tell all these haters the second dream? <laughs> That's what he's gonna do, watch. He has a second dream, lo, I've had another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. And he related it to his father and his brothers and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream you've had? Shall I and your mother? and your brothers actually come and bow ourselves down before you on the ground? Oh man, like dad's like, like serious dude? You gotta you got ease up on the dreams. His brothers were jealous of him, but watch this, his father kept the saying in his heart. Okay, so you got this thing going on where this guy's dreaming. Now what do you do with dreams like that? Anybody in the room ever had a dream and everybody looked at you like you were stupid? Hey, listen, I'm the baby of 12 kids. You know, I, 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 this, is, this is an arrogant statement, so I'm prefacing it with forgiveness, okay? Come on, give me a little love right now. <laughs> I pastor a church. I'm one of the last of the 12 siblings to get saved in my household. I think I was like number nine or 10. Everybody's a Christian now. Okay, so, so I, I'm like number nine or 10. I'm a pastor. My brother Steve leads worship here. My brother Paul has preached here. My brother or sister Angela and my sister Jojo who have done the women's stuff here. Like they've all served in my church. Is that cool or what? Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I wish Steve was here for that. I wish he led worship this morning. No, no, listen. listen. Ideas are small. You have to put out action to your dreams. Ideas are small. 
You can dream of making a difference in the world for God, for yourself. Listen, you can dream of having a good job. You can dream of having the cutest girl, guys, young guys, I'm talking to you. But if you don't ask her out, she ain't even getting no girl. I'm just telling you straight up. If you don't go apply for the job or get educated or do what you need to do, you are not going to reach your dreams. All dreams take what? Action, all of them, all of them. And the number one thing I see, number one thing I see is most of us fear taking action for this reason. What if I fail? Listen to me, look at me, everybody's eyes on me. You're gonna fail, you're gonna fail. That's part of the process where God shapes and teaches and trains you. Don't let that be the reason you don't make it. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail. You're going to do it wrong at times. And at times, you're going to shock the heck out of yourselves, and you're going to totally kill it. And then you're going to walk out of the room going, I'm the best. <laughs> and then God will deal with you on that one too. I promise. That's just how it goes. But what I want you to do is to dream and to take what? Action. You've got to do something with the dream. See, listen, if you dream, people are going to be jealous of you. You need to know that. People around you will be jealous of you. They're going to say, listen, Jesus was rejected. Why do we think that we won't? He was. So listen, Jesus was not accepted in his hometown. A lot of times when we bring the message of what we think God has called us to, to the people closest to us, they'll be the first ones to question it. But watch, watch. That's not a bad thing. Because it'll either kill your selfishness or it'll establish what God actually spoke. That's a good thing. Joseph could have got all oh, me, stupid brothers and sisters. He didn't do that. He told the dreams and he waited. By the way, the guy ended up in prison. The guy ended up stuck. And then he interprets, watch, the dreamer ends up interpreting a dream and he ends up second in command under Pharaoh years later. And who do you think has to come and bow before him to get food because there's a famine? None other than his family. So the dreamer was actually dreaming accurately from God. And they throw him in a pit. They sell him off into slavery. They torture the poor kid. And then he has this understanding. He says this, you all meant it for what? Evil. But God meant it for what? Good. 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 Listen, you should paste that on your forehead, write it on the windows, because lots of stuff is going to happen in your life that's going to feel bad. But you need to know this. God is in it. And if you're, part, if you're part of the family of God, you're one of his kids, he designed you for success, not for failure. And listen, this is not some American weird preachy thing. I'm talking about walking in faith, church. I'm talking about not losing heart, not giving up, not settling for less than what God has for you. I'm giving you permission to dream right now, to go hard after. Some of you are like, I'm old, I already got my life done. No, you're never too old for God to do what he desires to do for you. Never. Moses, 80 years old. 80. 8 zero. That's old. Abraham, how old was he when he had his son? 100. You're like, please God, no. I don't want to be 100 having a baby. That's crazy. Listen, the truth is this. Don't ever lose your dreams. Don't lose hope. Don't lose your dreams. Rejection will be part of it. Jealousy will be part of it. Listen, few principles. You can write them down if you so choose. Don't tell your dreams to people who are going to doubt you and going to be negative. I'm not talking about like the discussion I had with my wife. She's my helpmate. She's my co-laborer. Listen, if she can't speak wisdom into me and God placed us together, no one can. I'm talking about when you tell somebody you're dreaming, they're like, how stupid, you can't, you're not even smart enough to do that. You can't, you take yourself down the street. Don't tell people your dreams who are always going to be negative about them. I'm not talking about people who will shape your dream. I'm talking about people who don't even want to partner with you to believe for God. Don't share your dreams with people like that. Tell them to people you can trust. Tell them to people who believe in God, who are positive. Listen, I said this last week. I'm going to say it again this week. My goal as a church right now, because God just has stirred this in me so deeply, my goal is to make your dreams come true. Amen. It's my goal. So when people come to me and say, I have this idea to serve the homeless, let's do it. I have this idea to kind of lead, unleash worship in a new way, let's do it. I have this idea to go, go out into the community and do, let's do it. You know why? Because in my heart, I'm thinking this. If God is birthing an outreach in you, a ministry in you, a passion in you, I, as your pastor, need to help that happen. We, as a church, need to support the outcome of that. 
Does this make sense at all, church? Yes. See, because I think this, God is releasing something right now and he wants us to believe in him. He wants us to take risks, to believe that things can happen. Listen, tell people you can trust, who believe in God, who are positive. I mean, listen, let me, let me tell you, because tell you, I hear lots of stories. I'm the pastor, right? Some of your stories, I'm just saying. No, I'm, I'm playing. I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. teasing. It had to, I had to be funny a little bit. If you don't believe they can do it, just say, let's, let's pray. See, because what you can't see, God can. You got to remember that. Your eyes, I had somebody come to me, what do you think of this movement? What do you think? They were picking something apart. And I said, ah, you know, I, I see a couple issues. But at the end of the day, it's up to God to determine what the outcome of that's going to be. And they're like, yeah, but don't you think this is wrong? And I said, no, I'm not going to chime in. They really wanted me to side with them. They were trying to get me to say this was bad or wrong or ungodly. Or, and I'm like, listen, it may not be where I want to live, but I'm not going to say it's not God because who am I to say that? I'm not who? God. I'm not God. So I just kind of step back. I don't want to always be the person speaking negativity and criticism and all of that. Here's another one. Get people around you who support the vision. If it takes more than you, get a team. Like one of the things I really love about the season we're in as a church, and you can ask my elder board. They're, they're, you can ask my staff as well. Hey, we have this idea to do this, pastor. Go ahead. They're like, go ahead? Well, what do you want us to do? It's not my idea. It's yours. They're like, well, you want me to just move forward with it? Yes. Do you want me to report back? Sure. And they're, but they're, that's so different. They're all kind of like, okay, when are you going to tell us what to do? I'm not. <laughs> that's what I'm, I'm trying to help you take a risk and listen, listen, and learn from trying and maybe failing. But you're all the better for taking a risk and taking a step and growing Get people around you to support the vision, who believe who will release you. And listen, this is so practical. Make a list, make a plan. Make a plan. Listen, you two just got married. Did you sit down and make lots of plans? Otherwise, your wedding day never would have what? Well, it might have happened, but it might have been really chaotic. But you made a plan. If you've got something you want to head toward, make a what? Plan. plan. Make a plan. You've got to put together something that helps you see where it is. So making a dream move forward. You know, the Bible's full of dream language. Like God talking, not only literal dreams, but speaking possibility into people, speaking release into people, the opportunity to move into to more power into different season. See, often God will release dreams in the middle of difficulty. I hate that. What about you guys? you're in the hardest season you've ever experienced and God says, hey Mo, why don't you lead all these millions of people through the desert? I'm going to set them free. Well, he had the dream to set them free because he killed the, the Egyptian servant when, when he decided that God was speaking to him. But God comes back around and, he, and then Moses starts to stutter because he's afraid now. All of us face that. You're in the middle of the worst season and God will say, here's the dream. You're like, what the heck? How did, why, why didn't you speak it to me when I had lots of money and everything was easy? <laughs> Come on, am I talking to anybody right now? Why didn't you speak to me when I didn't have these encumbrances and these difficulties? Why not when it was easier? See, dreams happen in the gap between what is and what should be. See, God moves. L listen, I hope some of you catch this. This is super important. God moves on people's passions in their hearts when the thing that he wired into them and the need collide. You have this desire to serve the homeless and then you see homeless. You're like, I got to do something. I have this desire. Like, what's kind of interesting, I don't know what God is doing with the Guatemala church thing, but I'm smart enough to know this. I felt it. Somebody else wrote me a note because they felt it. I'm going to plow the ground and see what God says. Because when I was there, this is what I noticed. And you can ask Ramona and Tracy, they were with me. We're in these villages. I don't see churches. I don't see a Bible school anywhere. How are they, how are they ministering to people's spiritual needs? Now, I don't know. I, I have a phone call this week. I might make this phone call and they might go, oh, we've got a master's program. We've got 300 pastors. And I, they might have a plan. But I didn't see a plan. And I didn't see churches. I saw one church right next to the hope of life. I didn't see any in the Upland Village. I didn't see it. And I might be there, but I didn't see it. So I saw a need, like maybe there's something that connects the dream to expand the kingdom of God. And maybe it's not here. 
That's a sw- tough one for me to swallow because my idea is building, got to get a building, got to get a bigger building, got to, you know, got to, got to finish, establish. And then we've got to lead leaders and train leaders. We've got to send them out. Who wants to go out? Anybody want to go out? Let's go out. That's what goes on inside. Like, let's go do this thing. And, and I'm realizing something about the way that I'm wired is that I'm kind of stupid and crazy. Most people aren't. Most people aren't as risky. Most people aren't as daring. That's not a bad thing. I'm just saying not everybody wants to roll the dice. Some of you do, though. Maybe you go to Guatemala with me. Okay, let's keep going. You never know. But dreams happen in the gap between what is and what should be in your passion. The, those things collide. See, I, I, turn in your Bibles to Habakkuk, one of the minor prophets. Um, ha- Habakkuk is a prophet. You guys are like, Habba what? If you have a phone, H-A-B, Old Testament. If you have your Bibles, it's after Micah and Nahum, and it is before Zephaniah. You're like, what? Those are books in the Bible, Pastor? It's not a disease, I promise. Those are books in the Bible. They're names. I know we don't ever do the minor prophets, but, but this one's important to understand how God releases dreams. Now, you've got the people of Israel who God has promised to establish. We all understand this about Israel, right? They're God's people, right? Yeah. Say yes, pastor, they're God's people. So you're like, I just, yeah. just want to go to lunch. Is he done yet? No, I'm not done yet. I'm close though. L- l- listen, listen, they're God's people and they're in captivity. They're stuck in Babylonian captivity. And this is, so that you understand who Habakkuk is, he's a contemporary of Daniel. So those of you who've read the, the Bible, Daniel, and he's, and he's just prior to Jeremiah. So he's one of the, the post-exilic prophets as they're about to get free. That's when he's ministering. And so the people of God are in captivity and he's coming and God is going to speak to him. He's a prophet. So this is how it starts. Chapter one of Habakkuk, verse two, it says, how long, O Lord, will I call to you for help? Anybody ever prayed that? Are you ever going to listen to me or what, God? That's what it translates to. He's frustrated because the things of God seem to be slow. Anybody ever had the things of God slow? Yeah. It's tough, man. Waiting's tough. Would you guys, I don't know why God makes us wait. I mean, I do, but I don't. I don't like it. I don't. He says, how long, O Lord? Do, do I have to wait for help? And you will not hear. I cry to you violence. In other words, I'm looking at what's wrong, and I'm saying you should do something, God. Yet you don't save. Why do you make me see iniquity and you cause me to look on wickedness? Does this sound like California, like big time right now? What do you mean you're going to take Bibles out of the, out of the you can't sell them? Well, let me help you guys. I, sometimes I watch some of the posts on Facebook. It's a First Amendment right. They're not going to stop us from selling Bibles. But listen, pay attention. You guys should be emailing and calling your representatives and doing all of that stuff right now. You know why? Because if you don't do anything, that's when evil, what? Triumphs. You should be active. I posted on Facebook a whole bunch of times. I think it got three likes. I'm like, really? Now, maybe some of you guys went on and posted, but you need to go on and tell them, I am completely opposed to this whole banning of Bibles nonsense. But, oh, I got, oh, you guys got me started. <laughs> okay, hang on. There is a movement in California right now, this is important for us, where we as Christians are not allowed to minister to people with issues of sexual orientation, nor, listen, gets worse, is the public sector, psychologists and so forth, allowed to minister to them or counsel them at any level. There's a move to get that passed right now in California. That means if somebody is struggling with identity, sexual orientation, we can't even talk about it. You should be emailing and calling your representatives. You should be doing something that says, I'm a citizen here, this is what? Wrong. Wrong. That's what's going on. He's saying violence, violence. There's stuff, God, don't you care? Listen, God cares. Let's keep going, let's keep going. And why do you make me see iniquity? Verse three, and you cause me to look on wickedness. Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. There's just battles everywhere. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. Does that sound like the world we live in right now? By the way, any time the people of God try to stand up for righteousness, wickedness will contend with it. We should not be surprised by this. Listen, I love you guys. I love you guys. Our culture many years ago decided to stop honoring God and we're living in the result of that today. Now, God has not forgotten America or California or any of that. 
I think, Ronnie, you sent me a prophetic word saying that purity is going to be released in California. Can I get an amen to that? That'd be amazing to see God restore purity in California because we are the, like the most crazy. Anyways, I'm, I digress. Okay, so, so, it, it, so he finishes chapter one by saying problems, problems, more problems. God, you don't care. You send the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans, by the way, are the, the sorcerers, the, the witches of the day. And, and they're like wicked and they're doing, it's just ugly and it's evil. And then watch what God speaks to him. Flip over to chapter two. Verse 1, he says, I will stand on my guard post and station myself as a rampart, an access way, and I will keep watch to see what, we will, what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I'm reproved. The Lord answered me and said this. So Habakkuk's going in the spot where God can speak and God speaks. Listen to what God says. Very simple. The God who's the rescuer of Israel, the, the promise of the father of his people to lead them into a promised land, okay? You with me? You tracking? The Lord answered me and said, record the vision, inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens forward toward the goal, and it will not fail. Some of you are like, man, we're going to hell in a handbasket. No, we're not. See, we've believed all the narrative that we see on evil TV and media. We just, we buy it. Oh man, it's horrible. The sky is falling. Listen, there is a resurgence of God happening. Listen, church, I hope you get this. Where sin abounds, grace what? Abounds all the more. So if we live in the worst, or one of the worst states in the entire union, that means there's a more opportunity for the grace of God. So you guys should be excited. And you know how you guys look like this. That's how you guys look. I love y'all. I'm just playing with you. But you should be excited. If you live in wickedness, there's more opportunity for God. There's more opportunity for him. We should not shrink back because things are difficult. He says, record the vision, inscribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens forward and it won't fail. Though it tarries, though there's time involved, wait for it. For it will certainly come. It will not fail. So, so listen, if God is saying this, that the way that I've wired the human existence is that I've set into motion what I desire to happen. What needs to happen is the people of faith need to walk with what God said to do. Does this make sense? This is not rocket science. God said, go take the land. We should do what? Go take the land. God said, dream, go help the homeless. You should do what? Go, go help the worship. You should do worship. Pray. You should do pray. But you know, you know the Bible commands us to pray. You know the worst ministry in our church is prayer? The least attended. That's what I'm saying. Because we're too busy to pray. That's the truth. We're, it's just, it's too hard to stay focused. You want me to pray for an hour, Pastor? A whole hour? Like, how do you stay focused praying for a whole hour? It's, it's actually not that hard when you start praying and when you get around people who do pray. Now, of course, I pitch all that, and there's no prayer this Tuesday because we're doing the Mother's Day D. But anyways, following Tuesday, you all should come out for prayer. See, the people of God were in a difficult spot. God said this, record the vision, write it down, make it easy for people to follow. You know, I, I did this. I, I assessed myself with what I'm reading right now. Goes on to say, you know, make it easy for them to follow. It will not fail. Wait for it. Be patient. It will certainly come. The righteous will live by faith. That's what it finishes with. And I looked at this and I said, record the vision. Okay, I've done that. I've done that. Write it down. Sort of. Make it easy for people to follow. Uh-oh. It won't fail. Well, how, how can they be successful if they don't even know where to go? Well, like I just started to look and say, God, how am I doing with this? And he said, you're not clear enough. People don't know what to do. Like if you watch, watch, I'll just ask you guys. You're new or newer to our church. You like Sundays. You're like, hey, this is a pretty cool place. I like it. What's the next step? Anybody know? Going to keep on going to church. I, I hope that's true. I, I hope I'm funny enough to keep you in the building. Hope I teach the truth of God. Enough, but that's not the next step, though. Get Serve, get involved. You know, that's the good Christian answer. But no, that's actually not it. You should become part of the community. You should make a commitment to it. You're like, I don't want a commitment to nothing. You're going to ask me for money. No, I'm not. I don't need your money. And neither does God. I ask you to make a commitment because I understand people are wired by God to live in covenant. And when we don't, we struggle. So I, the next step is this. You should become part of this. Say, this is my church. 
Now I should start getting involved and serving and becoming part of the, I should be in a small group. I'm too busy for a small group pastor. I know, go to a different one every week. I don't care, just get some feeding. Go to the women's ministry. Go to something that helps you grow. But pastor, how do I do all this? Because you make it a pry. Thank you. Listen, you will grow with whatever you put energy into. Listen, if you put energy into eating, you'll grow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You will. You put energy into working out, you'll grow, won't you? You'll grow. You put energy into your spiritual life, your spiritual man will what? Grow. grow. You'll grow. Whatever you put energy into. I, I love, I, I mean, I want to get around this. I love this though. One, one guy said, show me your checkbook and I'll show you what you value. Where you spend money is what you value. Where you put your time, show me your calendar, where you're putting energy, and I will show you what you value. Some of you are like, I'm too busy to value anything else. Then it's not a priority. I'm not being mean, I'm just being matter of fact. When we prioritize the things of God, our spiritual health, then we become healthier spiritually. Watch, and we make better decisions. Anybody ever made bad decisions because you didn't listen to God? Come on, all your hands can go up, you know. And then you stop and you ask God and he leads you. You're like, oh, that could have prevented all of that pain. Would have been so much easier had I just done it God's way to start with. I'm trying to encourage you, do it God's way to start with. See, listen, we hope because we're loved by God. See, if we don't have the love of God, we are with, without any possibility in life at all. Romans says it this, Romans 5, 5, it says that hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given us. See, it says this, that his love is poured inside of us. We feel it. We feel the warmth of it. You know, one of the ways you feel the warmth of it, and I'm not trying to pitch small groups. I, I'm not. I'm trying to pitch connection. So hear me right now. This week, Steve taught in our small group, did a really good job. Did a really good job. And we were all together, and, and I ended up leading worship with Julia, which I haven't led worship in a very long time. And then Bella came home in time, and I go, good, I don't have to do it. The girls can do it. And Bella goes, Daddy, can you do it? I, I, like, I led worship at school yesterday, and I had a busy day today, and I just getting home from my softball game. And so I said, okay, well, will you sing with us? She goes, oh, yeah, I'll sing with you. I led worship. It was really cool. It was really cool to just do the connection time with the people in my group, to just ready our hearts before God to receive and then to have Steve teach. And, and then the, the meeting ended. You know, the meeting ends. You people don't have homes. You don't know how to leave. I'm just saying. No, but seriously, the, the meeting ended. And I, I want to say we, we probably finished, I don't know, 9.30-ish or something like that, 9.15, 9.30. I don't think anybody left till around 11. I'm like, I want to go to sleep. Get out of my house. No, I'm playing. <laughs> I'm totally kidding, but, but it was this. We were in the other room, and I looked at Rob, and Steve was standing there, and I said this to both of them. I said, I said, what's happening in there is as deep spiritually as it gets. But if you went into the middle of the conversation, they were talking about puppy dogs and Mother's Day teas, and they're showing pictures, and I'm sure they were talking about things they don't want boys to hear because it's mostly the girls on that side. It, but they were just connecting. They were connecting. Some of you need to do what? You need to connect. You need people in your life. You need to be around the people of God. See, one of the ways we discover the, this hope that doesn't disappoint is because God's love is shed abroad in our hearts. Watch. And it's shed abroad in our hearts through you and you and you and because we're together caring about our journey as Christians, loving each other. It doesn't get more powerful than this. I know all of us, we make excuses. I get it. I'm busy too. Anybody not busy? Anybody not busy? If, if you're not busy, I want to hire you. No, I'm playing. I, no. Everybody's busy. Our schedules are full. Our calendars are demanded of. But if we want to go, grow spiritually, we have to put energy into the things of God. You know, Kevin, are you in here? I want to invite you to come up. You know, I want to close, and I do want to give opportunity for some of you to get prayer. And as I was preparing this morning um, and kind of going through notes and praying and whatnot, I just kind of had a sense that God was saying, just like, don't make it crazy. Like sometimes, you know, come to the altar, you got to cry and make it a power. No, no, no. That's not what I sense. I just want to read psalm, a psalm over you and then give you some of you the opportunity to get prayer because I believe this principally, that when we're talking about dreams, some of us have to take a step to reinvigorate, ignite what God has already said. 
Some of us have to dare, watch, listen, dare to dream again because you've experienced pain and people have done wrong things. You know, it could be spiritual leaders, it could be bosses, it could be husbands, wives, maybe your kids. People reject and then we go inward to preserve ourselves so that we don't get hurt. And God doesn't want us to live like that. He wants us to dream. So I want to ask you to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to read this over you, but I want to just bow your heads, close your eyes. I just want you to stay focused on God. I just want you to kind of listen and let him speak to you as I do this with you. Now, this is Psalm 25. And I'm just going to read it and kind of explain as I go through it. He says, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Listen, some of you in the room right now, you've had a lot of life stuff happen to you and it's been difficult. Like you've had a hard time, you know, being risky or daring or, or believing that people or a person or a group won't just hurt you again. And I get it, we've all been there. We've all experienced different points of, of difficulty and pain, I understand. But what God does with that kind of stuff is he says, I, I wanna invite you to put your soul in my hands. Watch, listen, because God is trustworthy. That's why he's saying that. Because if he's asking for it, he can shape it in a way, the circumstances, in a way that will help you to move past the pain. And he says, oh my God, in you I trust. He's making a declaration. He says, don't let me be ashamed. See, some of you are right in that spot. I want to dream, but I don't want to fail and I don't want people to mock or tease me if I do fail. Listen, at some point, listen, this, at some point you have to decide that honoring God is more important than what people think. All of us have to make that decision. We all have to make the step to say, I want my life to be pleasing to you first and foremost, God, no matter what other people think. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Don't let them celebrate when I fail is what he's saying. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Wait, 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 he's making a declaration that when we're in places where we've got to wait for God, that no one who waits on God will be ashamed. That to me, church, is a promise. That's a promise. Waiting on God is the smartest thing you'll do. Often we act, we go out of line, and it gets us into huge, huge trouble. Those who deal treacherously without cause, they'll be ashamed. So the ones who rise up against you, this is saying they're the ones who are gonna be the ones with egg on their face, so to speak. He says, make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. Listen, if you're trying to figure out how do I dream, how do I move, listen, listen. It starts like this, God, here I am. And I need you to show me. And I need you to teach me. And I need you to help me discover what you're saying. Because people are people and not everybody will fail me, but often people fail. But God never fails. So when you wanna know where God is leading, sometimes we just gotta stop and say, God, lead me and teach me. He says, for you, O oh God, are my salvation. He's not putting his hope in anything else but God. For you, I wait all day. Remember, O oh Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness, he's assigning it to the character and the nature of God. Like, I'm gonna wait for you, God, because I trust that your compassion and your loving kindness are better than anything else. For they've been from old, you've never failed. Do not remember the sins of my youth, my transgressions, according to your loving kindness. Remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. You know, some of us in our lives, we're struggling. We're making mistakes. We're doing wrong things. But if you'll go back to God, he'll, he'll instruct you in the way out of the sin. He leads the humble in justice. And he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. See, listen, God is wanting to release us back into believing that he's bigger than our experience today. So listen, we're gonna go in to sing one song and, and I don't want you to leave when we sing the song. It's gonna be a few minutes, one song. And, and when we do that, I'm gonna ask the ministry team to come forward. If you feel like you need prayer, 
Maybe you're missing the mark. Maybe you need to repent and you just need to get your heart right with God. That, that's good. Maybe you need to just believe for something, for anything. Maybe you've just forgotten to dream. Or maybe there's a dream that God has already spoken, but it's been time, maybe even years. And for you to believe that the dream could be real is, is just hard to do today. So as we go back in, maybe you need to repent. Maybe you need to see a dream. Maybe you need to re-believe the dream. If that's you, when we stand to worship, I just want you to get out of your chair, come forward, let them let him pray with you. Let them pray for you and believe for a release of God. So I'm gonna ask you all, let's stand together. Let's stand and Kevin's gonna lead us in a song. And as we sing, if you need prayer, I don't want you to hesitate. Just get out of your seat, sneak up to the front and let these folks pray for you. So Father God, we wanna to come to you right now and make our hearts tender, honest, <clears throat> obedient to you. God, let us not be people who shrink back at the face of what others might think, God, that we would go with passion and hunger after your, your grace and after your, your loving kindness and truth. So God, as we worship, I pray that you would meet each one of us through worship and with prayer as you see fit. Thank you, God. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name.
that you lead us in the revisioning and redreaming and repenting even. God, that you would help us to discover your goodness and your faithfulness and your love for us. So God, as we go, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would release dreams this week, that things that have been forgotten or left behind or ignored, God, that you would rekindle them in us and create a new fire and passion in us. So God, as we prepare to leave today, I pray that we would be leaving the building, but we would not be leaving you behind, that you would go with us as you promised and you would lead us and guide us. Thank you for this morning and all that you accomplished in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.